Good morning, everyone. How are we doing? Nice and hot. That's good. That's good. All right. So how many of you have enjoyed the Unhurried series? Okay, only five people? Okay. All right, a few more. I think most of you have. How many of you have lived unhurried lives in these last three weeks? Uh, Fewer hands, one hand, okay. I fell into that same trap over the last three weeks. I got caught in um, just frantic busyness, not that was put on me, but that I put on myself. I ended up losing sleep hours. I ended up breaking my routine. I ended up battling to find my rhythm and my routine again. But in that, the most important thing, the thing that I lost the most was my time with the Lord. There were a few days when I just just couldn't. I was just too tired, and then I got to work, and I had to do things, and and I replaced my time with the Lord, and I could feel it. And that is the purpose of unhurrying our lives. We unhurry our lives so that we can be more attentive to the Lord, so we can hear more of what God is saying. So for me, this series has come at a really good time. It's been a good reminder to live a slow, simple life, to take the Sabbath, which is a gift that is given to us, and to resist crazy busyness. And John, when he encouraged us to resist crazy busyness, he gave us something to make us busier. Did you all read it? Okay. If you haven't read it, please do yourself a favor. It's that little thing that was put out, a little booklet by John last week, called titled Spaciousness, which was written by Pete Ascazero. And he talks about eight traps that keep our lives crowded, cluttered, and cramped. And then how to deal with it. And they're very simple things, but they're so insightful and such a help. So today what we're going to do is we're going to talk about setting your sail. As a child, I was privileged to have three brothers. I had a father who loved sport, and we would be outside a lot. We would be playing soccer and hockey and cricket and badminton in the wind. How does one do that? But we did it. We played table tennis. But the thing I loved the most was going sailing. We had a little boat, not a big boat, had a sail. And we were near a local dam, and we would take this boat. It was a bit of a schlep to get everything set up, take it to the dam, put it in the water, get everything, make sure everything was, that should be in the boat was in the boat. If I left out my oars, which I did once, it was quite a disaster. But get, make sure everything was in the boat, put up the mast, put up the boom, make sure the boom was up, and then put up the sail. The fun came when the sail was set in the right position and it caught the wind and we would just sail with the wind. I would would sail with the wind, hey? John was surprised that I could do that. Um, Just saying. But it was about, the thing was about setting that sail. And that's a term that comes from the 1500s, which means to position the sail to catch the wind to move forward the vessel. And that's what spiritual disciplines are about. They're about positioning ourselves to catch the wind of the Spirit and then to move with the wind of the Spirit. So it's about positioning ourselves through the practices of formation when we've heard a lot over the last two years, so that God can do the work of transformation. We can't transform ourselves. Okay, we can engage in practices of formation. It's about doing the things that I can do now so that eventually I can do the things I can't do now. So, for example, now I might only be able to fast from sunrise to sunset like we're doing tomorrow. Amen? Yes, okay, all right. But eventually, maybe I can do a three-day fast. It's doing what I can do now, strengthening those spiritual muscles so that later I can do what I can't do. It's about training and not trying. So one of the things Brahm and I have done during this series is we've tried to go to bed a bit earlier to protect that time in the morning, to make sure we're not so tired in the morning when we have our times with the Lord. Did I just say trying? 
we're training ourselves. Can you feel the difference? We're training ourselves to go to bed earlier so we can have better times with the Lord in the morning. We're not trying to go to bed. There's a difference. Paul said to Timothy, he said, physical training is of some value. But godliness, which the Amplified Bible calls spiritual training, is of value in everything and in every way. For it holds promise for this life and for the life to come. The eternal gain that Jax was talking about a few weeks ago. Spiritual growth and transformation are possible. It is possible for us to be transformed. It is possible for us to grow. But it is not inevitable, and it doesn't happen by accident. What is inevitable is that we are being formed. You and I are being formed every day in some way. And that formation might be accidental without us even realizing it, or it might be intentional because we're engaging in the practices that move us towards Christ. Robert Mulholland has this definition of spiritual formation. It's the process of being changed into Christ's image, and he says, for the sake of others. Spiritual formation is a process. Paul to the Corinthians says, as we contemplate, sorry, as we contemplate the Lord's glory, so we are changed, we are transformed from one degree of glory to another. We become like that which we contemplate. Let's put it another way. The picture we have of who God is, is formed by our spiritual practices, and that determines who we become. So the picture I have of God is who I become, but that picture is formed as I spend time with him and I engage in spiritual practices. So to contemplate means to think and reflect long, intently, and deeply about something. But spiritual and social commentators at the moment are saying we are losing our ability, our capacity to contemplate, to think deeply. So what is this thing? What is taking the wind out of our sails in this area? Taking the wind out of our sails is a, is a phrase that comes, it's a Navy term, which was a battle tactic for ships before they had engines or motors or whatever they call them. But it was a battle tactic that obviously the ship that could go the fastest in the water would have the biggest advantage. So in order to slow that ship down, what I would do, if that was my enemy, I would come between the wind and that ship. Thereby taking the wind out of that ship's sail and slowing that ship down. So what is taking the wind out of our sails? And we've spoken about it in the last few weeks, and we've spoken about it previously. It's those things that distract us. We are more disconnected. We are more dependent. We are more depressed. We are disinformed. We get information, and we don't know where, if it's true, if it's not true. And the theme of the series is we are dashing through life. In 1985, there were two cardiologists, Dr. Friedman and Dr. Rosenman, and they noticed that all the patients, or most of the patients that were coming to them, battled with a harrowing sense of time urgency. And they coined a phase, hurry sickness, and that has been used by psychologists in America. I'm not sure that it's being used here. It's not yet a diagnosable condition. But what they said was that hurry sickness is a continual struggle, an unremitting attempt to accomplish and achieve more and more things, or participate in more and more events in less and less time. Anyone relate to that? King Solomon, who was credited with the wisest man, with being the wisest man who ever lived, at the end of his life, he said that his ambition to pursue accumulation, to pursue accomplishment, was meaningless. The New Living Translation says, like chasing the wind. So in our current culture, how are we chasing the wind? 
the Barna Institute, they did a study amongst Christians, they did a survey amongst Christians, and they found that the majority of Christians really have a desire to grow spiritually. That's good news, huh? Yeah, I think that's good news. But the majority of Christians do not have a plan as to how they want to grow spiritually. Also, the majority of Christians are too busy, say they are too busy to give the time required for the process of spiritual growth. The number one hindrance to spiritual growth is busyness. 2023, how many of you remember 2023? The highlight of 2023 was the Rugby World Cup. Okay, we had one person with that answer in the first service, so I'm so glad you guys are awake. We were top of the world, huh? number one in the world. But last year, unfortunately, we were also number one for something else. South Africa was number one for spending the most amount of time on the internet. So there's a, a group called Data Reportal who produces every year, they produce a, an overview, a global overview of the use of the internet and how people are spending their time online. And it's quite a thorough thing. They've been doing it at least since 2017. And they're even now doing a monthly thing. And you can go to each country and see what's happening in each country. It's quite amazing. But they said that South Africans on average per day are spending over nine and a half hours online. So we can think, well, we're actually a very studious nation and we're studying very hard. The reality is it's almost four hours of that, three and three quarters hours, three and three quarter hours of that is actually scrolling through social media, the average South African. Not only that, we weren't first in this category, but we are spending more than four hours a day watching TV online. So that's whether it's streaming or broadcasting. But we did come second in that category to America. So my question is, are we busy doing nothing? Are we busy distracted, as Jack spoke as well? Our over-engagement in the digital world increases our inability to contemplate, to think deeply. So to resist being squeezed into, the, into society's mold, to move counterculturally to the customs and to the behaviors of the world and of South Africa, to position ourselves so that we can be transformed into the image of Christ, we need to renew our minds. We need to change how we think. And we cannot do that without also addressing our use of digital devices. Amen? So I was encouraged to watch last week The AI Dilemma, which has been um, produced. It's a documentary, uh, one, one documentary that is produced by the Center for Humane Technology. So they look at technology, they look at the trends, they look at what is happening, and they're not against technology, and please don't get me wrong, I'm not against technology. Don't, don't walk out thinking I am, I'm not against technology. We're talking about the overuse of technology. But they said between 2017 and 2020, the race online was for our attention. What could they put out there to hold our attention? And Facebook obviously did quite a marvelous job of that. Um, we can see that. But in holding our attention, what they did was we got more and more disconnected from relationships, in relationships. The race at the moment with artificial intelligence and that's not a green thing somewhere over there. It's, it's happening on our screens, etc. But it's now for intimacy. I read that last week. And I woke up the next day. I'd updated my watch um, the previous evening. And I woke up in the morning and it said, Good morning, Kerry. Not in that voice. And I was like, Oh, that's so nice. And then I thought, Race for intimacy just pulled me in in that moment. It's still nice to have it, but um, I think for me, what is concerning is that there is an escalation of the capabilities of artificial intelligence that they can't even predict. The programmers can't even predict. 
So, for example, one of the things that happened, and this is not one of the, the heaviest things, but if I, for example, if I'm watching a screen and there's a picture of a giraffe there and they take an, a functional MRI scan of my brain, what happened was that if I fed that scan into AI without them knowing what I'd watched, which we think they didn't know, but without them knowing what I watched, they would recreate. So say I watched a picture of a giraffe. I looked at a picture of a giraffe. From what is happening in my brain and from feeding that scan to them, they could tell, and they could redraw the picture of a giraffe. Not exactly, but pretty close. Same thing if I watch some sort of story here and they took a functional MRI scan of my brain while I'm watching that story and I fed that functional MRI scan to AI, they could recreate the story. Not exactly. Okay. It's horrifying, but I don't think, in fact, I know, God is not taken by surprise. Okay. When we see some of the, the other things that are happening as well, there is a global move currently to practice, to emphasize formational practices, which is what we've been doing over the last three weeks. And what has been spoken about globally, this is not just Anthem that's doing it, is Anthem, but there are many other churches engaging in that. And I don't believe it's coincidental. I believe it's part of God's plan to deal with what is taking the wind out of our sails. And I believe that it's part of his plan to position us to catch the wind of his spirit so that we can move closer to him. Spiritual practices help us to stand against being sucked in. I want to share something that happened to me this week, and it was quite sweet. I mean, it was quite delightful, actually. I, um, on Monday, I was speaking to someone, and they were really going through quite a heavy day. And they were just saying the delight of their week is a Thursday evening when they do line dancing. And I just thought, oh, that is so nice. I'd looked into that for Brahm and I, and somehow communication had got lost. It'd be such a nice thing to do because I'm not really good at doing exercise for the sake of exercising. And so I said, oh, please send me the number and everything. Tuesday morning, I found out that God talks about line dancing in the Bible. Do you know that? I read this in songs of all scriptures or books. It said, where is the lady of Shulam who dances between two lines? And I just thought, God, AI's got nothing on God. <laughs> It was just such a moment, you know, when you're just like, God, you actually love me. You know, those little moments where he just encourages and he blows wind into our sails, and it was just a beautiful moment. He is so much more powerful than AI will ever be. Henry Nowen says this. He says, a spiritual discipline is necessary to move us slowly from, am, from an absurd which means irrational, illogical, futile life to an obedient life. So the word absurd, in the word absurd, we find the, the Latin word, I was going to say Zulu, not Zulu, the Latin word surdus, which means deaf. In the word, the word obedient is taken from the Latin word, and I'm going to say it, and if it's wrong, that's wrongly pronounced, it's okay, ab audia which means to listen. So what he's saying is that the spiritual disciplines move us from a place of being unable to hear what God is saying, to being, from being deaf to what God is saying, to a place of being able to listen to what God is saying. From a place of being absurd, illogical, irrational, in, inappropriate, to a place of obedience. So it's through the spiritual practices that we are able, we are position ourselves to hear what God is saying. And thankfully, we don't do that in our own strength. God's grace is there to empower us to walk in what he's called us to walk in. So in um, Titus, Paul writes to Titus, and he says, God's grace, it is through God's grace 
that we are saved. But it is also through God's grace that we are able to reject ungodliness and worldly desires and live sensible, upright, godly lives that are lived with purpose and reflect spiritual maturity. God's grace empowers us through the work of his Holy Spirit. So grace is not opposed to effort. Sometimes we think because we're living in grace, let's not get into works righteousness mentality. But God's grace is not opposed to effort. He is opposed, it's opposed to trying to earn what God has given freely. In fact, it is effort and it's action that positions us to engage, to, to become formed. So, oh, are you okay there, doll? Okay, all good. As previously said, we are formed either unintentionally through the world around us, or we are formed intentionally through practices that move us towards Christ. So I think like me, I, like me, many of you have got areas in your lives that you need to change tack. You're going in a certain direction, and we maybe need to go in a different direction. So in sailing... Most of the time in sailing, we had to do what was tacking, which meant we kind of, to get to my, our destination, we had to zigzag. It wasn't like if you've got an engine on your boat, you switch it on and you just move to the other side. Basically, you had, I had to work with the wind. We have to work with the wind and then go in a certain direction. But if we kept going there, we wouldn't really end up at our destination. So then we had to tack, change tack. We had to set the sail so that it would flip around kind of and make sure you don't get knocked out in the process, and then you would go that way. But again, you couldn't keep going that way. We had to go this way. And eventually, by tacking, by zigzagging, we would get to the other side. So how do we change tack? How do we follow Jesus? How do we do the things he did? How do we become like him? And obviously, the answer is through the spiritual disciplines, through the spiritual practices. And there are four kinds. We can categorize them, four kinds of practices. So there's pra there are practices that we do, that we engage in. Like tomorrow, we are fasting. Amen? That's a practice we engage in. Actually, it's not. I, w I was going to use that for the next example. Okay, so let's use something else. Like giving, it's something that we do. Worshipping this morning, something that we do. There are other practices where we stop doing something, like fasting. Okay, when we're fasting, we stop eating for that period of time. Another one is Sabbath. We stop working. And then there are, as we've learned over the last few weeks and previously, there are public expressions which is us all getting together here today, getting together tomorrow night to pray, getting together on Wednesday to hear Robin Tooley. But then there are also private practices. So for me, that's journaling. It's my devotions time with God. It could be solitude as well. We all have one thing in common. We all have this one limitation. We all have only 24 hours in a day. But... We all have different circumstances. So we have different personalities. We are different stages of our lives. We have different job requirements. We have different family commitments. And because of that, we will tend to gravitate towards certain practices more than other practices. And that's okay. It's important to work with our personalities. It's okay to work with our personalities. But it's also important to incorporate those practices that we find harder because those are likely to be the practices that form us or trans put us into a place where we are most transformed. For example, if I'm struggling with a behavior I want to stop, for example, if I gossip and I recognize that and I want to stop that, I could engage in the practice of silence, say for half an hour every day for a certain amount of time to develop self-control over my tongue. 
if, for example, I have a problem with um, pornography use, what John Mark Comer says, he says you can, we can engage in the practice of fasting, denying our flesh. So I just want to put it out there. If anyone is battling with pornography use, please speak to us um, in, in, at Anthem Recovery. We would love to help you. So don't just fast. Let's do some recovery work as well. And then if, for example, we are overcome with a behavior that is kind of keeping us from doing something, that keeps us not doing something. So, for example, say I am lazy and I'm apathetic. What I need to do in that situation is I need to commit to practices that will keep me doing something. So I commit to serving at church. I commit to serving the poor. I make a commitment to do that. Or if I am, if I battle with pride, no one here battles with pride, I know that. But if I battle, if someone out there battles with pride, which is a lack of humility, what I can do is I engage with a practice of serving others, getting involved in community, taking time out by myself. There are different ways. Okay, so we can deal with different situations in various ways. So the last three weeks have been about understanding the importance of setting our sails using different practices, like slowing down, like taking a weekly Sabbath, like reading a little booklet to slow us down. But today's call to action is to the private practice of, ta-da, limiting our screen time. But the encouragement is to start where you are. So if I am, for example, if I'm on my screen eight hours a day, I'm going to try and limit that to six, reduce it to six hours a day. And try that for a few weeks. See where we are, see where you are, see where I am in three weeks' time. If I hit that six-hour mark, let's see if I can reduce it even more. If I can't manage to hit that six-hour mark because I'm consumed maybe by social media or whatever, let's get some recovery help as well because that might be important in the process. But not just that. If I just have that in my head, that's not going to be enough. I'm going to challenge us as well to the more private practice of sharing the commitment that we've made with one, at least one other person, or with our home group. So share it with someone because it helps to keep us accountable if we share that. If we keep it to ourselves, it's probably going to go out the window. So my trust today and my prayer today is that we would take time out of our schedules to unhurry and to chart our course in terms of putting the practices into place, the practices of the last three, four weeks. And that as we do so, we would experience the delight of catching and moving with the wind of the Spirit. Thank you.